strange seeing this because I never expected this. Because three times you tried to take off in, in the, you know, on the plane, and it, the weather was dreadful. experience with certain ideas as to what the manager should do, faith in those ideas and faith in the future of the club. In 1945, Matt Busby's arrival would breathe life into a sporting giant and inspire a coaching revolution that would innovate and change the history of football forever. At the end of the Second World War, former Man City and Liverpool player 36-year-old Sergeant Major Instructor Busby returned to his beloved Manchester and began to build his dream at Old Trafford. After decades of underachieving, United needed a long-term outlook. The Reds had initiated a youth policy in 1938 with the formation of Mujak, their junior athletic club. This yielded many talents, but the Second World War interrupted its progress Busby wanted to kickstart the most successful breeding ground for sporting talent the country had ever seen. My first idea was to try and build on young boys, young players, and bring them up in the club atmosphere and the feeling for the club and uh, character-wise, loyalty-wise. It was very rare that you saw a 16 or 17-year-old boy in a, in a, in a first, uh, first division side. And his idea was to build a, a nursery, a youth team, and fetch him up as a family. Busby had already recruited his star maker, Jimmy Murphy. An opponent from his playing days, Busby had also witnessed his motivational capabilities whilst with the army in Bari in 1944. A fiery Welshman, Murphy would be responsible for transforming their raw skills into those of professional players that would take on the world. Matt was in charge of the first team and father was in charge of the coaching for everyone else and the recruitment of all the young players. So they used to start off with Bert Wally when they were 15, 16, get passed up to my father who ran the youth teams and the reserve team and my father used to mould them into first team players. Busby wanted to scour the back streets of Britain to find the most talented players. He'd met Joe Armstrong whilst at Man City and would eventually place him in charge of United's scouting network. Armstrong would build contacts around the country and his natural charm and persuasion would be crucial in getting players to sign on the dotted line. If they got hold of the mother, or he got hold of the mother, that's, uh, you were halfway there. My dad used to say, if you send a boy to school, you send him to the best school. And we've got the best school. And gradually you're able to prove it. The elite youngsters brought in from outside the region were housed with landladies. United would be their family now. Meanwhile, Bert Wally finished his United playing career and was installed as Jimmy Murphy's assistant. Tom Curry, known to Matt Busby as the best trainer in Britain and Bill English, also formed the coaching axis on which United's playing foundations were built. The stadium's future was less certain. Old Trafford had suffered direct hits by two German bombs in 1941 
and still needed rebuilding when Busby joined. The club was practically bankrupt, but somehow within three years of joining, he guided his first great team to FA Cup success. It's unbelievable when you look back, you know, the crowd and the meet the king and all this sort of nonsense. It's, a, it's a, something special, very special. On the 4th of May 1949, whilst Busby was building his dream, another had sadly come to an end. An air crash wiped out Italian champions to Reno. They'd won four league titles in a row and were four points clear on the day of the disaster. The English coach, Leslie Leesley, who'd played a handful of games for United in the early 1930s, also perished. All 31 passengers on board died. In 1951, Matt Busby signed 25-year-old winger Johnny Berry from Birmingham City. Previously, Berry had tormented United, and he made an immediate impact at Old Trafford. As each bright star arrived at United, the youth team was becoming packed to the rafters. The junior players were starting to make the veterans sit up and take notice. And nobody more so than a young man from Dudley. Then he came into the, uh, the Dudley schoolboys, uh, which he was only 11 then, and uh, he was head and shoulders above everybody else. And uh, you could see, you know, he's got the quality, you know, at 11 year old. I come from West Bromwich and we played games against him and uh, we knew he was already going to Manchester uh, and he was going to sign for him when he was a young lad and uh, we was all jealous of that really because we, uh, we all wanted to get to Manchester. He had huge charisma, his charisma spread around the city and you felt when you were playing, if he was with you, you know, you, you were part of a powerful entity. He made uh, everybody who was sort of played against them looked very, very tiny and very small. Duncan was the best player I've ever seen in my whole life. In March 1952, British European Airways' first production airspeed ambassador was brought into operation. The twin-engined aircraft was a versatile new passenger plane. Its high wings and large windows allowed uninterrupted views from every position in the interior. BEA named their class of ambassadors Elizabethans to honor the newly crowned Queen. It was also a breakthrough year for Matt Busby since he'd taken over. United had finished runners-up in the league four times. This time the veterans managed one final great push and lifted the trophy, ending a 41-year wait for the title. The FA Youth Cup started in the 1952-53 season. United would dominate the competition, winning for five successive years. They were the cream of the country's talent, steamrolling the best of the rest. It was just assumed that we were, as, as a youth team, a better team than anybody else who were playing. And that was sort of instilled into you. And you, you never went, you always went out thinking you were going to win. And of course we, we, we never lost a game. We were that good. But I don't think anybody, I think they could have played two teams on the pitch at once and not beat us. I put it all down to Jimmy Murphy and Bert Wally. The success of United Duty at that time. They complimented each other because Jimmy was a hard man, really hard. Sometimes I, I ended up crying coming home from training, but uh, determined to do better the next time. But Bert was the one who put his arm around you, pat you back and say you'll be there and so on. And Jimmy said, you won't be there unless you do as I say. Since taking control, Busby had always given young players a chance in the first team. But as, as his fabulous 48ers aged, the conveyor belt of talent could not be ignored. And from 1953, the United manager decided to throw the team over to youth. Mm. Sort of like a friendly up at Kilmarnock, uh, pre-season friendly. But he put three of them in, and they came away and drew to all, and he was delighted. He was absolutely over the moon because these lads had done so well. Uh, it was unheard of for young players to be on the chance against the real rough, rough lads of the, of the first division. 
but when when they went onto the field, these young lads performed miracles. My dad, above all, was a winner. Whatever he did, he wanted to win. He wanted to be the best. And so for him, when people were coming to the team who were better than the people in before, he saw that as fantastic and a real opportunity. I heard a, a story at one time, and I don't know where it came from, but it was actually my father who, who penned the, the, the term Busby Babes. Now, whether that's true or not, I really don't know, but it, it sounds like one of the things that he would have, one of the terms he would have used, you know, he would have looked for some, some way of, of describing this particular fresh new team. In March 1953, a vital piece of the United Jigsaw was put in place. Centre forward Tommy Taylor was signed from Barnsley, though Busby didn't want Taylor to be burdened with a large transfer fee. I says, well, putting £30,000 in this lad's said, Nick, put him under pressure. I'll give you 29999 This is all right, we'll accept that. matured so much, he did mature Roger and he actually become a very good leader really, Roger Dunn. His early days didn't suggest that. He become a very good captain. He did have some quite, you know, challenging discussions I think with Samat during his career. I think there was only ever going to be one winner, understandably. But I think he learnt from that and I think he became a stronger person out of that and a better player. I think that stood him in good stead in t for leading this young team of, of highly talented individuals. Byrne was the new leader of a team on the brink of greatness. In goal, Ray Wood, the great shot stopper signed from Darlington in 1949. Dominating defenders, Bill Folkes, a former miner from St Helens, and a giant Yorkshireman, Mark Jones. Wing halves, Eddie Coleman, a Salford lad nicknamed Snake Hips, due to a body swirl that would send even the crowd the wrong way, the Dudley Colossus, Duncan Edwards. Northern Ireland's Jackie Blanchflower could play in several positions. Wingers, Johnny Barry, the oldest member of the team, a tricky and brave player. David Pegg, a Doncaster lad, quick and clever on the ball. Inside forwards, Liam, Billy Whelan, a Republic of Ireland international who scored goals for fun, and a Manchester boy, Dennis Violet, a player with a razor-sharp football brain and a deadly finisher in front of goal. Tommy Taylor, a phenomenal centre-forward who scored 131 goals in just 191 games, a goal-scoring ratio with no equal at Old Trafford. A wealth of further talent including Bobby Charlton, Albert Scallon, Kenny Morgans, Jeff Bent and Wilf McGuinness were waiting in the wings and there were many more. The 1950s saw the breaking down of cultural barriers. The birth of the teenager, rock and roll, gripped the world. And amongst all of this, the babe celebrity was growing, along with Manchester's burgeoning nightlife. And nobody was more popular than the young Red Devils. Eddie would turn up in velvet collar, you know, four buttons and uh, drain pipe trousers. But it, it was a great driver, was Eddie Coleman. He was a, he was a star, he was a cheeky chappy, lovely personality. It was unbelievable. You go to pictures in the afternoon and of course at the end the very lights used to go on and you had people who used to come up for autographs. There was a barber that everyone just knew as Harry the Barbers. 
and uh, David Pegg, Ruth McGuinness had took David Pegg there one time for a haircut and David Pegg looked like an old film star called Victor Mature uh, a good looking fella big bro. and everyone used to go in and say can you have a David Pegg haircut? It just seemed to be natural for him to know exactly what to wear and, and you know we, we used to, we were quite flabbergasted once when he came home in a pale grey suit with a pink shirt and a pink tie and we'd never seen anybody in a pink shirt and a pink tie before but he looked very good in it. Tommy was the real character of the team. Uh, oh yes, he was the scream of the lad, you know, we all used to get him so well together. Uh, when, when it was time for bed, Duncan would be off to bed, he was a great lad, you know, for looking after himself. Oh, yes, He'd he... say to Tommy, go on Tommy, you get off, off to bed. <laughs> Tommy would say, oh, you, you get off, I'm stopping. The young lads were the heart and soul of the new United. Their camaraderie shone through and inspired a rare passion among the Reds fans. However, the Busby Bades' greatest success still lay ahead of them. And that's how Manchester United in the dark shirts, kicking off in the match that should decide the league championship. Matthew. Finally their promise had been fulfilled and the Babes secured their first title in 1956 with a 2-1 win over Blackpool. Beauty, the goal Next thing we know, we're one down. Um, Johnny Bellis took a ball through. I went past the full back into the box. Um, I got George Farm came out, tracked me around him, and he caught me in the good penalty. Great chance there for Violet. This time it's a penalty. Johnny Bellis shared penalty taking duties with Roger Byrne. Prior to the game, though, the captain had a premonition about missing a spot kick. Roger shouts to Johnny, are you okay Johnny? He said, you take it if you want. Oh, he said, no, you take it. And Roger wasn't even facing. When the penalty was taken, he was facing his own goals, Roger. But Johnny slotted it home and then Big Tommy got a goal in late on in the game. United would eventually win the league by 11 points, despite the average age of the squad being only 22 at the start of that campaign. The team contained just two players from the side that won the title four years earlier. The gateway to Europe was now open, and despite the Football League's fears that it could threaten domestic competition, Busby was convinced of its value 
and defied the governing body's wishes. United with the England's European pioneers. At that particular time as well, had realised how good we were. We were we were a good team, and we were winning regular, regularly. And if uh, if we got the opportunity, you know, we we would take some beating. But but there was a lot of doubts because you you didn't know who you were playing most of the time. You'd not even seen them, not even on film. We had some weird trips. We went to Bill Bow one time, and uh, uh, Bill Folks had pushed something against the heater and shut it off. And poor Mr. Hardman, who was our chairman then, was a very small man, but he, he, he was like a skeleton when he came out and he was frozen, you know. He, in fact, he needed hospital, well, he needed doctor's treatment. And they used to worry about what they were going to eat. Some of them used tectins and beans and things like that, just in case they didn't like the food. And we heard about them going into these places like Spain and uh, going into the Iron Curtain and all them places, it was just like, honestly, again, it was like what I'm saying, a voyage of Sinbad. It was like being on a magic carpet and going off. And it was brilliant. Well, I know my mother was horrified. She, she saw there was going to be trouble. I don't know why, but she hated it when they, went, when they got into Europe. She couldn't see any good that was going to come out of it at all. I don't know why. United sent shockwaves around the continent, beating Anderlecht. 2-0, then 10-0 at Main Road. They then narrowly defeated German challengers Borussia Dortmund before facing Atletico Bilbao in the first leg of the quarterfinals in Spain. The Reds were in danger of being dumped out of the competition. Bilbao scored first. Two more goals before half time. Until a Liam Whelan wonder goal gave them a lifeline. What is particularly poignant about it, of course, is the picture uh, that was taken when they were coming back from Bilbao of all the players on the wing of the plane sweeping the ice off. In the second leg, United produced one of their greatest performances in Europe, thrashing the Spanish side 3-0 on the 6th of February 1957. We used to feel that team could do anything. The phenomenon, a great game that was. And that crowd that night, people in Piccadilly three miles away could hear the roar. We all walked back to Manchester, and it was all singing. And there was uh, Busby's old king, Tommy Taylor, centre forward, Johnny Berry, the wizard of the wing. <laughs> Waiting for United in the semi finals with the mighty Real Madrid. The European yes, champions Real, gave them a lesson in the first leg. Spanish hopes fluttered in the sand. And near the end, Mateo scored for Madrid and then invited the applause. So Real Madrid won 3-1. Paul Britain will be cheering Manchester United at Old Trafford. But in the return game, United were already showing signs that they were learning how to beat. In the second leg of the European Cup semi-final. Here's Madrid on the attack. Centre forward to Stefano shoots, but goalie Wood tips it round. And Liger flash, they're up the other end with winger Copa beating Wood for a goal. Then Madrid break out, inside left Real shows how it should be done. Left winger Peg has the ball. He centres, it bounces off Taylor and Whelan makes sure of it. So the European dream was put on hold, but the Babes did retain the domestic league title and had the chance of a record double in the FA Cup final against Aston Villa. Are, are you getting very tense up about this Cup and League double? No, no, it's not worrying, it's not, well, it's not worrying me anyway at all, but uh, I don't know about some of the younger lads. United were the youngest team ever in the final, but were dealt a decisive blow early in the game. The ball comes from the wing to Peter McParland who heads, Ray Wood jumps for it and they bring each other crashing down. After six minutes, goalkeeper Ray Wood suffered a broken cheekbone, following a charge by Villa striker Peter McParland. With no subs allowed, Jackie Blanchflower took over in goal and McParland returned to Hompton, scoring two goals in a five minute spell. Passes to McParland and Blanchflower hasn't a chance, one up for Villa. A hot shot hits the post, then McFarland bangs home the rebound. 
Tommy Taylor soared to a trademark header, but it proved a late consolation. The Babes would have to content themselves with the league trophy. December 1957, after a patchy first half of the new season, United signed goalkeeper Harry Gregg from Doncaster Rovers for a record fee of £23,500. So out of the world record fee, I got what was called an accrued share of benefit. I got £33. But honestly, I had paid £33 those days to join Manchester United. It was everybody's dream. A squad of 42 players still contained only four members who had been transferred in from another club. Around Christmas, United started to regain ground in the league with wins over Leicester and Luton, a 7-2 victory over Bolton and a Cavalier 5-4 win at Arsenal. On the morning of the game at Highbury, United director George Whittaker was found dead in his room. This didn't stop United providing the last great demonstration of their genius on home soil. What a game. I mean, 5-4. I mean, it's unbelievable. Two top teams, two great defenders, and they lay no goals between them. <laughs> it's not on. It was two men up, then it went to three each, then we went to five three. I know it was a bit bothered. We knew he was going to win. We went back in the catch room half time, and if I can remember rightly, I never knew the manager to lose his nut. He did. It's always easy to put these things in a package and say that was the greatest ever game and all that. That was one hell of a game. You didn't actually believe the likes of Tommy Taylor. You didn't believe what you were watching. You didn't know how good it was. My dad took me to Arsenal uh, to watch the Busby Babes. It was a team that you won to even though you maybe wasn't a natural supporter. You won to. I don't think if I live another 50 years, they'll never forget anything. I'm going to live in all that crowd. They're unbelievable. United's second European campaign was well underway. They'd beaten Shamrock Rovers and Czechoslovakia inside Dukla Prague. Bad weather in Prague ended in a problematic return journey, and United decided to charter their own plane for the next foreign encounter, a trip beyond the Iron Curtain to face Yugoslav inside Red Star Belgrade. 36-year-old senior captain James Thane would be commander of the flight, supported by Kenneth Raymond, who had flown the team to Bilbao a year earlier. Both men would experience captains in their own right, flying thousands of hours on Elizabethans and also in World War II. Raymond had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross after shooting down six enemy aircraft and a V-1 flying bomb. Their bravery was, uh, it was sort of their duty. Uh, there was this huge spirit and they didn't think of death and uh, they just got on with it. He had flown with Captain Thane so on many occasions so I think they were friends. Uh, and certainly there was great camaraderie on this trip. They would have all been excited about the Manchester United football team being on board. United had a slender 2-1 lead to protect over in Belgrade, and ahead of the trip, Captain Roger Byrne picked up a minor injury, which meant the team needed cover at left-back. During the week, he used to put a, he put a team sheet up, and then he put the players to uh, were going with them. And I was, I was selected to go on with, with the team. He says, Ronnie, come here. So I says, what's the matter, Jim? He says, come, come around here. So he took me into another room and he says, the boss has just been on the phone. Roger Byrne's been hurt. He's hurt his leg. And he wants Jeff Bent to go in your place. My attitude was, I'm asking for a transfer when he comes back. <laughs> of course, I never, never experienced anything like that again. But... Uh, I was very, very disappointed, really was disappointed. On the coaching side, Jimmy Murphy was away in charge of the Wales national team, so Bert Wally travelled in his place. The United Party would also draft in a diplomat from the Yugoslav Embassy in London to help with the foreign customs they were about to encounter. When we arrived in Belgrade, there were, there were about 100 journalists uh, and a lot of people at the, at, at, at the old airport 
waiting, welcoming uh, the Manchester United. It was a great event in Belgrade. Already fans were marching up and down the streets, carrying flags and and, and, and singing and shouting. Pre nego što mi je odigrali tu utakmicu, mi smo znali da da su postale bezbijeve bezbijeve bebe i da su to bili stvarno izuzetno veliki igrači, vrlo mladi, veliki talenti, ali se videlo da su to igrači koji su bili obučeni i koji su imali jednu veliku futbalsku disciplinu. percent of the public were dressed in military uniform. The pitch was marked in 